We're going to be starting the AS Biology course with the first topic about biological molecules. In this topic, we're going to be learning about four types of molecules. It is water, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. For this lesson, we'll only be focusing on water and carbohydrates. The next topic is going to be proteins and lipids. So I'll first start with the properties of the water molecule. Water molecule is really special because the electrons within this molecule are not really shared equally. There's a pair of electrons here. There's another pair of electrons here. Now these electrons are pulled by the oxygen atom more than they are pulled by the hydrogen atoms. That's because the oxygen is a bigger atom, so it's pulling those electrons towards its side. Electrons being negative means that the oxygen here is going to be slightly negative, right? It's not going to be fully negative because we're still sharing electrons, but we're just sharing these electrons unequally. On the other hand, the hydrogens are going to be deprived of these electrons and they're going to be slightly positive. You could see here I'm using a symbol here, small delta, to indicate a slight charge rather than being fully charged. This results with water being a dipole. The word dipole stands for having two opposite charges within the same molecule. When having more than one water molecule near each other, they tend to attract. This sort of attraction is called intermolecular forces. That's because these forces of attraction occur between neighboring molecules. They don't occur within the same molecule. Now, we've just said that hydrogen is slightly positive and oxygen is slightly negative. Positives and negatives tend to attract each other. This results in special attraction here between these opposite charges. This attraction is called hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds attract the water molecules very well and changes many of their properties. In this picture, we see a network of hydrogen bonds between many different water molecules. You can always see that it's the hydrogen and the oxygens are the ones that attract. And as a result, all of these water molecules are attracted to each other. This is known as cohesion. Cohesion is the attraction between water molecules among each other. And this results in water always, always clumping closely together and forming drops. So we could see here in this picture how water molecules are always forming these kind of drops because of the hydrogen bonds. This cohesion between the water molecules, which results from hydrogen bonds that exist between them, results in some unique properties. One of them is the fact that water has high boiling point. The boiling point of water is much higher than most other liquids. The reason why that boiling point is quite higher is because for water to boil and change its state, it needs to break these hydrogen bonds that exist between the water molecules. And you could see here how many these hydrogen bonds, there is plenty of those hydrogen bonds. So the change of state of liquid water requires heat energy to break all of these hydrogen bonds. This explains the high boiling point and the high specific heat capacity of water and its latent heat. Specific heat capacity stands for the fact that water takes a lot of heat energy to change its temperature by one degree. Latent heat stands for the fact that water takes a lot of heat energy to change its state. The fact that water is a dipole explains its ability to dissolve many substances such as sodium chloride or any other salt. The water molecules arrange themselves in a special way whenever you drop an ionic compound or anything that is charged or polar. So once salts are dropped into water, 
the water molecules align themselves in a special way. So you could see here how the oxygen pointing towards the sodium, while the hydrogens are pointing towards the chloride. Oxygen is slightly negative, so it points towards the positive sodium, while the hydrogen is slightly positive, and they are pointed towards the chloride. So the dipole nature of water explains why it's a very good solvent. In a little while, you'll find that every ion is surrounded by layers of water molecules. Again, you really have to watch the orientation because it's unique. The oxygens are pointing towards the sodium and the hydrogens are pointing towards the chloride. These layers of water around the ions are known as hydration shells. The dipole nature of water helps to dissolve carbohydrates like glucose. Carbohydrates do have hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen in the glucose here are slightly positive, slightly negative. So this attracts the water molecules towards the glucose and this forms some weak forces of attraction that really helps to dissolve the carbohydrates. So the reason why glucose dissolves very well in water is because water molecules form hydrogen bonds with these slight negative and slight positive sides of the glucose molecule. We're gonna now move to carbohydrates. Carbohydrates come in three major classes. The first class is called monosaccharides. One good example of monosaccharide is glucose. Glucose is the building block of all other types of carbohydrates, including the disaccharides and polysaccharides. So we'll first focus on monosaccharides like glucose. All monosaccharides like glucose have this unique ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. So that ratio is unique to monosaccharides. So, for instance, the formula of glucose is C6H12O6. Only monosaccharides have this ratio of 1 to 1. And that helps us to distinguish between monosaccharides and disaccharides that we're going to be learning about later on. Glucose comes in two types. There is alpha glucose, like this one here and beta glucose. The only difference between alpha glucose and beta glucose is the position of this OH group. If it's alpha glucose, then this OH is going to be pointing down. Beta glucose, on the other hand, has this OH group pointing upwards. It is quite important to know the number of the carbon atoms in the glucose molecules. So we tend to number these carbon atoms starting from this side by carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So alpha and beta glucose are different by the position of the OH group on their first carbon. Again, if this OH is going down, then it's alpha. Beta glucose has the OH on carbon number 1 pointing upwards. Throughout this course, we're going to be dealing more with alpha glucose. So most of the molecules that we study include alpha glucose. Beta glucose is only found in one polysaccharide known as cellulose. Monosaccharides combine together to form disaccharides. So right here I have two molecules of alpha glucose. When these two molecules come close together, they will form a condensation reaction. So once these molecules come close enough, the OH in the first molecule and the H in the other, it could be the other way around, condense to remove a water molecule and we end up having a bond. This bond is known as glycosidic bond. So the glycosidic bond exists in all carbohydrates, the polysaccharides and the disaccharide. It's always useful to put numbers for the glycosidic bond to indicate which carbons are involved in this bond. So in this case, it's carbon number one and carbon number four are the ones involved in this bond. So that's why I'm gonna call this bond 
1,4 glycosidic bond. Now, since the molecules are alpha glucose, then I have also to say it's alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. We're going to do a comparison between monosaccharides and disaccharides. So the first point of comparison is the fact that monosaccharides have the unique ratio of CH2O. Since we've removed the water molecule during the condensation reaction to form disaccharides, then this ratio is not there in disaccharides. Another difference is the fact that disaccharides have a glycosidic bond. So glycosidic bonds are only found in disaccharides. They're not really found in monosaccharides. One obvious point of comparison is that monosaccharides are just made up of one unit, while disaccharides are made up of two units. Similarities between mono and disaccharides include the fact that they are both made up of the same elements. So both are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Polysaccharides are polymers of glucose. In all polysaccharides, glucose molecules are attached to each other by glycosidic bond, the same bond we have seen in disaccharides. So each one of those hexagons represents one glucose molecule. One good example of polysaccharide is starch, which is found in plants. There is also glycogen, which is found in animals. We will first start with starch. Starch is made up of two types of molecules. Straight chains that are not branched, we call those amylose. And you got another molecule within this starch that is actually branched. This one is called amylopectin. This combination of amylose and amylopectin is what is known as starch. We're here going to take a look at the formation of starch. Starch start with molecules of alpha glucose attaching to each other by glycosidic bonds. The same 1,4 glycosidic bond we have seen in disaccharides. This results in the formation of a helical structure known as amylose. The reason why amylose takes this unique shape is because of hydrogen bonds. So once again, hydrogen bonds are involved in the formation of this helical structure known as amylose. Amylose being helical is quite useful because it makes it take less space inside the plant cell. The other part of starch molecule is known as amylopectin. Amylopectin is different from amylose because amylopectin has branches. The branches form at the sixth carbon. So it is actually this carbon, carbon number six in one glucose molecule with carbon number one in its neighboring glucose molecule. Now, as you can see, we have formed a branch and this is what makes amylopectin a branched molecule. So you could see here, we got two types of molecule within the starch. One is called amylose and the other one, which is branched, is called amylopectin. In this picture, we see molecules of starch or starch grains inside the plant cell. As you can see, the molecule is quite compact. Being compact is helpful because it takes less space inside the plant cell. So you could save more energy in less volume inside the plant cell. Starch grains or starch molecules are quite large. This is another unique property because it helps the starch to remain inside the cell. One more unique property of starch is the fact that it doesn't dissolve in water. So being insoluble in water is quite helpful because if starch was substituted with glucose molecules which were soluble, then this will attract water inside the cell and that will affect the osmotic pressure of the cell. And that's not really good because attracting water inside the cell will cause the cell to expand. And in the case of animal cells, then the cell will really burst. So starch being insoluble is more efficient 
to store energy in that form. In this last part, we get a look at food tests. So we're required to learn how to test for starch. You've probably seen this in your IGCSE. Starch test is done by adding drops of iodine. Iodine gives blue-black color if starch is there. And in the absence of starch, the color is brown. So brown color is the negative result and blue-black is the positive one. The other test that you need to learn here is the test of reducing sugars. All monosaccharides and disaccharides are actually reducing sugar. The only exception is sucrose. Sucrose, which is made up of glucose and fructose, is a disaccharide that is not really reducing sugar. The Benedict test requires heating in a water bath. So the water bath here is set at 80 degrees and in the presence of reducing sugars, the color will turn either green, orange, yellow, or red. The more red the color here, the more the reducing sugar. So this is a negative result. There is no reducing sugar in this sample. Green is the least amount of reducing sugar, and red is the maximum. It's not easy to determine the colors of the Benedict test by just using our eyes. So we got here a more advanced method to judge the colors in a more accurate way. This device is known as the colorimeter. So the results from the Benedict test can be put here inside the colorimeter to be able to judge the color in a more accurate way. The device gives us a digital value or gives us data on how much reducing sugars are present. The colorimeter exposes the sample here with light. The light has to be of one wavelength so that's why we use specific colored filters. As the light penetrates the solution inside the cuvettes, the color will absorb the light. The more the intense the color is, the less light that will pass through. So here at the end you have a light detector. If there was an intense color like deep red color inside the cuvette, then there will be less light transmission and there will be more light absorption. The terms absorption which stands for how much light has been blocked by the colored particles is opposite to the term transmission. The more intense the color, the less the transmission because the colored particles will block the light and they will absorb more of this light.